Okay, here's the Quran, pure Arabic. Muslims believe that the Arabic language is the language of Allah. They also believe that the Quran, because it is perfect in their estimation, it is the exact representation of Allah's words. For that reason, only the Arabic Quran can be considered as authoritative. It, therefore, follows that those who do not know Arabic are still required to read and memorize the Quran in the Arabic language, as translations can never replace the language of Allah. Yet, is the Quran the Arabic document which Muslims claim it to be? The answer, unequivocally, no. There are many foreign words or phrases which are employed in the Quran, some of which have no Arabic equivalent and others which do. So much for that. <clears throat> Author Jeffrey, in his book, Foreign Vocabulary, the Quran, has gathered some 300 pages dealing with foreign words in the Quran, many of which must have been used in pre-Quranic Arabic, but quite a number also which must have been used little or not at all before they were included in the Quran. One must wonder why these words were borrowed, as it puts doubt on whether Allah's language is sufficient enough to explain and reveal all that Allah had intended. Some of the foreign words include <clears throat> Pharaoh, really, an Egyptian word, obviously, which means king or potentate, which is repeated in the Quran 84 times. B, Adam and Eden, Akkadian words, which are repeated 24 times. A more correct term for Adam in Arabic would be Basharan or Insan, meaning mankind. Eden would be the word Jana in Arabic, which means garden. <coughs> Abraham, sometimes recorded as Ibrahim. Ibrahim comes from the Assyrian language. The correct Arabic equivalent would be Abu Rahim. Persian words, Harut and Malrut are Persian names for angels. Sirat, meaning the path, has the Arabic equivalent, Al Tariq. Khur, meaning disciple, has the Arabic equivalent, Tilmith. Why not the Arabic there? Jinn, meaning good or evil demons. <coughs> has the Arabic equivalent Ru versus Firdaus, meaning the highest or seventh heaven. Let me fix that up a little bit. The highest or seventh heaven has the Arabic equivalent Jannah. E, Syriac words, Tabut, Taghuth, Sakat, Malakut, are all Syriac words which have been borrowed and included in the Arabic Quran. F, Hebrew words, Heber, Sakina, Maon, Tarot, Jananin, Tufan, Deluge, are all Hebrew words which have been borrowed and included in the Arabic Quran. Why? Greek words, Injil, which means gospel, was borrowed, yet it has the Arabic equivalent, Bishara, Iblis, is not Arabic, but a corruption of the Greek word, Diablos. Injil, or more phonetically in English, Injil, is properly spelled in Greek as Evangelion, from which we have, in English, the more rare form Evangel, meaning good news, archaic good spell or good gospel, and the transliteration Injil, or Injil, is basically a little distorted spelling from the original Greek word. H, <coughs> Christian Aramaic, Kiyama, is the Aramaic word for resurrection. Why are these in the Quran? Christian, Ethiopic, Ethiopic, Malak is the Ethiopic word for angel. Let's move on to the next. Now moving on to point F, the Quran supposed to universal supposed universal qualities. Another claim by Muslims for the authority of the Quran is it's universal application for all people and for all time. Yet is this the case? There are many who believe that the Quran follows so closely the life and thought of the Arab world during the 7th to 9th centuries that indeed it was written for that specific environment and not as a universal document for all peoples. In Surah 16, 26, 42, point to its uniquely Arabic character. 
In fact, the Quran, rather than being a universal document, served to provide personal advantages for Muhammad. Examples of this can be found in Suraj 33, 50 to 52, rotation of wives and special privilege of Muhammad, 53 to 54, privacy of Muhammad and non-marriage to his widows, and 66, 1, abstaining from wives or honey. See, Yusuf Ali's notes, uh, number 55229. Why would a document written for the benefit of all of humanity refer to a personal incidence of one man? Do we find similar examples in the previous scriptures and prophets? Indeed, it seems that Muhammad was the right prophet for the Arabs. He took their culture and universalized it. Take, for instance, these three examples. The Arabs gloried in their language. Muhammad declared it the divine language, maintaining that the everlasting tablets in heaven recorded the original revelations in the Arabic script. Yet he seemed to forget the fact that all the previous scriptures were written in Hebrew and Greek and not Arabic. The Arabs, glorified point two, gloried in their traditional practices and customs of the desert, practices such as predatory war, slavery, polygamy, and concubinage. Muhammad impressed upon all these usages the seal of a divine sanction. Yet it is these very areas which have proved such a stumbling block to the Western world ever since as they reflect little of the ethos of the preceding scriptures, an ethos which guides the laws and practices of much of the modern world today. The Arabs gloried in the holiness of Mecca. Muhammad made it the only portal whereby men could enter paradise. Yet there is no extra Quranic documentation that Mecca was much more than a small nondescript hamlet until well into the 7th century. It was not situated on the coast, nor did it have an adequate water supply like its neighbor Taif, which, unlike Mecca, was well known as a rest stop on the caravan routes. Thereby, therefore, one can say that Muhammad took the Arab people just as he found them, and while he applied some new direction, he declared that much that they did to be very good and sacred from change. And we go back centuries, we still have to do it then. There are other examples of a specific Arabic influence on the Quran, two of which are the status of women and the use of the sword. Okay, F1, the inferiority of women in the Quran. Women in the Quran have an inferior status to that of men. While the Quran permits a woman to participate in battle, it also shows, allows a Muslim husband to cast his wife adrift without giving a single reason or notice, while the same right is not reserved for the woman. The husband possesses absolute, immediate, and unquestioned power of divorce, Women are to be absolutely obedient and can be beaten or scourged for being rebellious in Surah 434. Yusuf Ali adds lightly, yet the Arab does not allow this inclusion, the Arabic. No privilege or of, a, of a corresponding nature is reserved for the wife. Men have doubled the inheritance of women. In addition to the four wives allowed by law, a Muslim man can have an unlimited number of slave girls as concubines or sexual partners, according to the Surah al-Nisa, 4.25-24-25. Even paradise creates inequalities for women. These Surahs, 55, 56, 78, state that paradise is a place where there are beautiful young virgins waiting to serve the righteous. These virgins, we are told, will have beautiful, big, lustrous eyes, and they will be maidens who are chaste, who avert their eyes out of purity, Yusuf Ali's note, number 552.10, and have a delicate pink complexion. Nowhere are we told that what awaits the Muslim women of this world in paradise, the Muslim mothers and sisters. One wonders who these virgin maidens are and where they come from. With Quranic pronouncements, such as we have read in the preceding chapters, it is not surprising that much of the Muslim world today reflects in its, in its laws and societal makeup such a total bias against women. Though statistics are hard to find, we do know that currently of the 23 countries with the worst records of jobs for women, women now making up only 10 to 20 percent of all workers, 17 are Muslim countries. Similarly, of the 11 countries with the worst record for disparagement of opportunity between men and women, 10 are Muslim states. The widest gaps were found in three Muslim countries, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Another revealing statistic shows that of the 12 states 
with the worst records for unequal treatment of girls, seven are Muslim states. The bottom three listed are UAE, Bahrain, and Brunei. While one may justifiably argue that this is not representative of true Islamic teaching, it does show us how these those in Muslim countries using the Quran as their foundation treat their women, and we might we might expect if we were living in that type of environment. With this kind of data before us, we need to ask whether the Quran is God's absolute word for all people for all time, and if so, then why only half of the world's population, its males, receive full benefit from its laws, while the other half, its women, continue in an unequal relationship? Does not the previous revelation, the Bible, have a more universalistic and wholesome concern for women? Take, for example, for instance, Ephesians 5, 22-25, where we find the, the true ideal for a relationship, saying, Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This scripture demands a sacrificial love by the husband, one which puts the interest of the loved one before that of his own. This sacrificial love is best explained in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 4 to 8. It is understandable, then, why so many people in the West see Islam as an archaic and barbaric religion which forces people back into the mentality of the Middle Ages where women had no rights or freedoms to create their own destiny and where men could do with their wives as they pleased. F2, the sword found in the Quran. Concerning the sword in the Quran, the testimony of Islam today is that of a religion which condones violence for the sake of Allah. Though many Muslims try to deny this, they have to agree that there are ample examples of violence found not only within the Quran, but also exemplified within the life of the Prophet Muhammad. While in Mecca, Muhammad was surrounded by enemies, and while there he taught his followers toleration, according to Surah 2256, which says, Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. As a minor player surrounded by enemies, he did well to receive this convenient revelation. But the call for toleration changed with his power within, when his power was established in Medina, once the charter had been written, which regulated life between the various differing groups. Muhammad needed a livelihood for himself and those who had come with him from Mecca. Thus he undertook a number of quote-unquote expeditions, sending groups of his soldiers out to raid Meccan caravans in order to find booty. Wow, that's controversial, contradictory, hypocritical. Though there was a rule in the Hijaz at the time not to fight during the holy month, Muhammad nonetheless, nevertheless sent an, a number of his troops to raid an unsuspecting trading caravan. This, this caused havoc in his own camp because the Meccan had been killed in the month in which bloodshed was forbidden. Promptly another convenient revelation came which authorized the attack. Interesting. Later on in 624 CE, after having been in Medina for two years, a Meccan caravan of 1,000 men was passing close to the southwest of Medina. Muhammad, with only 300 men, went out to attack it at the Battle of Badr. He defeated the Meccans and consequently received tremendous status which helped his army grow. The Medians, Medinians participated in further battles, some of which they won, the Battle of the Trenches, and others which they lost, the Battle of Udhad. In fact, Muhammad himself is known to have conducted 27 battles and planned 39 others. Muslims, however, continue to downplay any emphasis on violence within the Quran, and they emphatically insist that the jihad, or holy war, was only a means of defense and was never used as an offensive act. So much that. Sahih Muslim III makes this point, saying, The sword has not been used recklessly by the Muslims. It has been wielded purely with humane feelings in the wider interest of humanity. Wow. Take a guy's head off with a sword. That's not humane. In the Mishat Kat two, we find an explanation for jihad. Jihad is the best method of earning both spiritual and temporal. If victory is won, there is enormous booty and conquest of a country which cannot be equal to any other source of earnings. If there is defeat or death, there is everlasting paradise and a great spiritual benefit. This sort of jihad is conditional upon pure motive for establishing the kingdom of Allah on earth. Also, in Mishikat 2, we learn with regard to jihad that Abu Hiriyah reported that the Messenger of Allah said, To whatever, whichever village you go and settle therein, there is your share therein, and whichever village disobeys Allah and his message, its one-fifth is for Allah, and his messenger for the remainder is for you. 
so much for jihad.